But uh, I think this is a fabulous milestone in the evolution of HAN Radio. Thank you, Mark. It's very, it is very exciting. And uh, yes, we are streaming. You can go to uh, hanradio.com and just check on the live stream, and you'll get us. Yeah, here we are. So let's dive oh, into some cool. movies. Yeah, we've got a great topic. Uh, yeah. It's kind of a joint topic. So it's uh, horrific events mixed with real life natural natural disaster movies, and there's kind of a and, wide and, variety and in here. Case well, and in case anyone's wondering why such an upper topic, yeah. you know, we talk a lot about movies and we certainly talk about the, the ways that movies help us escape and the ways that movies entertain us. But there's, an, there's another very important function that movies play, and that is to help us understand bad things that can happen in our world. And this came to mind when we're... You know, filled with news right now about what happened with the plane crash in France and what's happening with the drought in California. And you think about over the years, all the movies that have, have, have helped us understand what has been behind other moments in time where people have had to pull together to get through experiences. And so as we started to think about this, it seemed appropriate to come up with the three key criteria for such films you beat me to it mark i didn't even get to i didn't even get to ask you about the the qualifications for this but 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 films about these big things that occur need to illuminate they need to tell me more about something than i once knew they do need to educate me about the facts and as as we talk we'll certainly talk about those that have played with the facts Perhaps most important, they need to motivate me to take action. And throughout this this narrative of, of films that help us understand big events, there is a continuity of ultimately it, they do motivate us to take care of the people around us, make positive contributions to the world. So in that regard, these are, I think, some important films. So illuminate, educate, motivate. And don't forget about the Golden Gate bridge because that's always in these movies i feel like that's like a staple <laughs> of the whole genre <laughs> kind of is <laughs> i was it has its own section oh, that's yeah. funny. on wikipedia is golden gate in tragedy movies i was going to say if you if you binge on on these movies that we're going to be talking about you you would never get into an airplane again right or a or a that train motivating yeah yes trains uh yeah. subways so where do we start we can or, start or, here or, on or, earth or, or we can Go ahead, Mark. Well, exactly. I think uh, let, uh, let's let's start with some of the more serious films, and then we'll we'll broaden out to some of the the, the silly ones. But when when thinking about this category of movie, the the first one that comes to mind, and it certainly is a tragedy we can all remember, but it's United '93, um, the the recreation of what occurred on United Flight 93 on September 11th in the heroic actions of passengers. Uh, it is for this type of film that is intended to help us understand why things happen. It is as well done as any has been, and it's directed by Paul Greengrass. It is so explicit and so moving at the same time. Yeah, I don't think you can go better than that for for the three criteria you were talking about. I uh, think Paul Greengrass's follow-up to that, Captain Phillips, was equally uh, kind of capturing a real-life disaster of sorts with the Somalian pirates. Although that movie got a little bit of grief for the way it took some liberties, from what I gathered. I mean, yeah. there, there was some criticism of that movie. I mean, I, I love Tom Hanks, so I'm more than happy to watch it, but there was, seemed to be some criticism behind that one. And, and that's one of the, Rob, one of the dangers of this genre is that as we've, we've talked about before, any time we're dealing with history, there is a tendency to judge a film for its accuracy as though it's taking a test at the same time it's trying to entertain us. And um, it, 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 I think that makes it that makes it difficult and for a movie maker to, to make the point, sometimes the facts have to be changed or events have to be condensed or characters combined. But uh, Paul Greengrass seems to, to have a, a knack for this kind of movie. It was like David Fincher has a knack for this kind and, of movie. And Tom Hanks also seems to be very comfortable in this kind of genre of movies. You've got Apollo 13, 
You've got Castaway with the right. plane crash, and then you've got him out at sea in Captain Phillips. He seems right. very in touch with his inner kind of uh, – What's the word I'm looking for? Savage man, like man <laughs> against nature type uh, situation. But Survivalist. Yeah. Survivalist, Sorry. thank you. For the sake of castaway, man against volleyball. Yes. <laughs> but it can also project sort of that inner calm that we, we'd all like to think we could, we could dredge up. In, right, in situations we're out in space like and the, the space shuttle's coming back down to Earth and we're Tom Hanks and, calm. And, and, and Steve, Steve, your mention of Apollo 13, that, that's the other um, that is just an ideal description of what this kind of movie should do because it is tense it is exciting it does motivate us but it really does give us a lot of facts about the space program and it helps us understand the challenges the space program faces and for those of us who are old enough to remember that event it is like it all coming back to life yeah, yeah. They, they, that was one of the things I, I was reading about it. It was that it was such a popular movie, even though everyone knew how it was going to turn out, the tension was, was incredible right. anyway. Oh, even to this day, I can still watch it and go, are they going to make it? You know, you can kind of almost suspend it. It's so brilliantly done. And well cast, too. You've got the really Kevin Bacon, was. Gary Sinise, uh, Ed Harris. Just a, one of the better casts in Hollywood history, I think. Yeah, very well yeah. cast. I agree. Ron yeah. Howard, obviously, he knows what he's doing. So shall we swing yeah, to something a little a little less uh, well, uplifting? The, one of the things <laughs> I had was that this kind of genre leaves itself to be spoofed very easily. Yes. And Hollywood has definitely taken its fair uh, <laughs> fair share of swings over the decades at these uh, kind of natural disaster and uh, tragedy movies. Surely you're not talking <laughs> about Airplane. Of course I'm not talking about Airplane. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a little factoid. Did you know that the original... Airport, which is the inspiration for Airplane, is actually based on a real event. Did you know that? I did not know that. Now, that was yes, the one with, 19... the, with, with the storm? storm I'm trying to remember no, which no, airport. No, that's the one with the bomb. It's the one with the bomb. They're oh, flying the... to Rome. Ah, yeah. okay. Well, there's also and a so snowstorm. Based... Hollywood's based redone it a few continental... times. Yeah. Continental Airlines Flight 11 in 1962 that blew up in Ohio on its way from Chicago to Kansas City. So it was intended to actually be something closer to factual or certainly something inspired by real events. I think by the time it was parodied in Airplane, we had left those behind. Well, and the, and the quality of the hero had, had sort of deteriorated over the years. I mean, we started with <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Burt Lancaster, then we went to Charlton Heston, and then it was Jack Lemmon, who just isn't, doesn't yeah. have the same and, kind and of persona. Yeah, he's not as serious. No, but, but Leslie Nielsen, it just reinvents it. Oh, there is, that's sublime. It's just the best. It's so great. I think uh, going back to Captain Phillips, I feel like there has to be a parody of that coming out soon, the whole I'm the captain now. I feel like that was probably one of the it's most... It's ripe for it. Yeah, it's definitely ripe. There has to be some sort of yeah. thing in the pipeline where they're making fun of those type of movies. It's um, we, Liam we, you know, it's funny minute. because <laughs> it, it did take, you know, the airplane movies went a little crazy because we had Airport 1970, then we had 75, which is the Charlton Heston, then we have 77, then we have Airport 79, and at some point, those movies almost became parodies of themselves, which gave license for Airplane to do what it did. And, and I think it's the fact that we have the, 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 the touching scenes in Airport 75 of the, of the ill girl. If you watch the parody of those scenes in Airplane, they're not all that different. Because Airplane, Airport itself had become a parody of what was perhaps intended to be something a bit more serious. Now, Mark, you you can attest to this. I, during the researching of this subject matter, it seems like Hollywood gets fixated on a specific area. They have the airplane phase, and then you see in 96 they have the twister phase, in 97 they have the volcano phase, and then most recently it's the tidal wave phase. of uh, There was the movie with Clint Eastwood that he did uh, that had a tidal wave, and then it, The Impossible came out uh, two years later with right. Ewan McGregor. 
Were those inspired by the the Thailand? Uh, I mean, obviously the impossible, the impossible was, was, yeah. was yeah. The hereafter yeah, the, one, I think, the, was the, too. It was really CGI. And, and, it was and, not... and, and it, when the hereafter came out, and it, it didn't do very well. No, it was some weird. Some people thought it quite odd. I actually liked it. I because I, I tend to find Clint Eastwood's mind quite fascinating. Um, it was inspired by older events, but the impossible is actually based upon the story of this Spanish family and and what occurred after the tsunami. And uh, they, they were changed, their characters were changed to the film, but I think it is such a good example of how you take the event and you take me there to make me live through the horror, but then you really do focus most of the airtime on how people get by and how people help each other and how people support each other. So it's a very redemptive kind of film. Whereas in the only John, the only um, pattern you overlooked, Steve, was all the earthquake movies that we had, as well as the alien you know, takeover. The alien takeovers movies. one was a big one too, but I kind of left that one out because it's yep. its own genre within. And itself. then we had earlier in the seventies a whole series of volcano movies, and um, then we have our our whole nuclear war thing. But I, I think that one of the things that these movies try to do, and some obviously do better than others is to give us, even when the plots are extreme, enough base with reality so we can identify the prompt as something that could happen. The more that we think something could happen as an audience, the more willing we are to ride with the filmmaker as the filmmaker takes the, tells the story. So you think about On the Beach, the great film from 1959 that really ask the question, what would we do if there was a nuclear war? Or you think about the China Syndrome from 1978 that says, what would happen if there was a nuclear meltdown? And certainly we have seen those things, you know, that certainly occur. So it, it, it is a balance between the reality and also a bit of fantasy that all movies have. I think there was an interesting trend too, which was the food poisoning on the plane. Yeah, <laughs> there were <laughs> there were a couple. Um, Zero Hour was was the first, and that was um, Dana Andrews and and Linda Darnell back in the fifties. Um, but it sort wow. of goes. Wow, goes, I have forgotten about that one. But it goes to the theme of of the planes in trouble. Someone has to figure out how to take it down. Um, who's right. the brave soul? The high who's and the going, mighty. Do yeah. You Who's the, who's the brave soul who's going to go into the cockpit and actually handle this? Yeah. Um, there's another one called Crash Landing that Nancy Reagan starred in. I just thought I'd throw that one in for... Oh, wow. Yeah. Ooh, that's a deep one. Yeah. It would be worth looking up. Yeah. That's that's like homework in, in plus. The, in the, in the, well, if you want to go back really far into the archives, you'd go to a 1936 movie called San Francisco that has the 1906 earthquake. Wow. Or, even better, a 1937 film called In o Old Chicago, which is about Mrs. O'Leary's cow knocking <laughs> over the, the uh, gasoline and starting the Great Chicago Fire of 1871. <laughs> and what's interesting is even those old examples, there's something kind of predictable about how these stories are told. The, these films, perhaps more than, than others, follow, if you look back, kind of the standard three-act sequence. Act one is always the setup, the background, what's going to occur, what could occur, and then the climax to act one is always the event that prompts the rest of the film, whether it's the crash, the explosion, whatever it may be. Or the act safe two landing. It's always about what we're going to do, how are we going to do it, there's no way we can do it, there's no way we can do it trauma 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 and in the best of film that's where we really learn what what it would take to get through such an event and then act three is is whatever the resolution is and you can really look at these films through that lens and you could say this is how they tell the story they do educate us first they do illuminate next and then they do motivate at the end so there's a little bit of a formula here that all of them um kind of adhere to in a way is there a uh, like an area that you find most terrifying or like most iconic in this genre? Is it trains? Is it planes? Is it boats? Automobiles. Automobiles. <laughs> you had to get that one in there. Right? You <laughs> know, I, I I think of the ones that we we've mentioned. 
the to, the impossible to me was a, a very difficult movie to forget because that tsunami staging felt so real and Naomi Watts was so convincing in her own fright that it was a, a very, very challenging movie to forget because it was so real. I think that some of them are so silly that we don't necessarily take them seriously. We can all remember Twister and when we you know, saw the house falling down. Come on, you know. That wouldn't really happen. And so I think that the, the closer people go to trying to make it feel like the threat is real, the, the more we're going to hang in there with them. And then in terms of the threat, uh, avalanches, fires, what do you guys think? What's like the most frightening type of natural disaster, tidal waves? You okay, know, wow. what gives you nightmares, Sally? What gives you nightmares? Well, Bloods. You know, lately we've, we've heard a lot of talk about asteroids and, and how there have been some near misses mm -hmm. recently, and, and that's been the subject of, of several movies. Uh, True. Uh, True. Asteroids hitting the Earth, and when you start thinking about the the events that follow that you could get pretty scared that's true uh i think for me it's water anything yeah, involving I, water yeah. water is very terrifying yeah. when you're just yeah. out there and you're the only boat. titanic yeah titanic yeah uh, we, how did we not mention titanic yet uh, lifeboat well, i think lifeboat yeah one of the titanic movies is actually a great example the 1958 at night, a night to remember, remember yeah. I, I i reserve mm -hmm. comment on the <laughs> you you always you always reserve comment on. Come on, Mark. Let's hear your no opinion of James. Afraid, there's no reason to be afraid of that water because it wasn't real water; it was digital. <laughs> I think for me, it's anything involving insects. Insects. Um, oh. I, I remember being That's terrified a... by Willard's the story of the killer rat. I mean, that, those kind of movies just creep me out. That was Crispin Glover, and right? Think as Willard, or is that the remake? There was an old one. I think that's the remake. Okay, I only saw the remake. But, but then I think, but then I, I, I guess I find ultimately frightening those those stories that are based on real things that have happened that sadly could occur again. I think of, of Steven Spielberg's Munich, which is such a, a terrifying account of of that attack at the 1972 Summer Olympics. I think of Hotel Rwanda. To me, these are horrific events that people create themselves and and that makes them perhaps even more terrifying and then we can't forget about independence day blowing up the white house come on mark we can <laughs> we can <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we can forget i of course it has that great bill bullion line about what is it this is our end of that movie has more climactic moments i mean it just uh I mean, the blowing up of the White and, House, you have to admit, like, that's a pretty iconic, like, like stupid it, image. I, and I, there were, you know, always what happens in these movies, the silly ones, that the wrong people die. <laughs> and the wrong characters died in that movie. Just like, remember in the Poseidon Adventure, you know, certain people die in the Poseidon Adventure, and you go, no, I liked her. She yeah. Can't. Keep her, keep her. Sure. Let this other one live. Well, do you think that, that the silly um, disaster movies kind of make it easier for us to uh, get get through our fears? I, I th You know, like the s snakes on the plane or um, what was that one? Oh, Lake Placid with the right. crocodiles. What about Piranha 3D and yeah. uh, Sharknado? Yeah. We can't forget about those. Yeah. Those classics. All <laughs> true. Yeah. Um, those are... And, and you were saying. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> we were talking so, about piranha and such other things, Mark. Oh, oh no! And uh, do you remember acropho an acrophobia? What was it? It was the one about the ants. Um, Ooh, I'm not sure what the I term just, for an mm, ant ant fear, fear of I, ants is. Arachnophobia. That. that was spiders. That's yeah. spiders. spiders. Thank you. I knew it was a phobia. Spiders, though, uh, not, I don't, not ants. I, you know, right. I, I don't. I right. don't think those accomplish anything other than sell popcorn. Well. A good Sunday, a Saturday afternoon matinee. Very true. Yeah. Yeah. But this this genre, especially when we are filled with a lot of news that is, is troubling, I think that going back and looking at some of these things that have actually happened, either through the lens of them stretched to be silly or realistic.
graphically portrayed to help us understand. I think that that there's a lot to to, to play with here, and you know, I I I I, I think about um, a couple that you know you might not even have 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 put into this category, but there's actually um, a, an outrageously bad film from 1967 that's really fun when it comes to a real event and being scary, and that's the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. And, and actually, if you can look beyond how silly everyone looks and how no one really knows how to hold a gun, <laughs> it, it does tell a, a, a very interesting story about how people can behave when they plot against other people. Uh, but it's, it's just a terrible movie. So it's a parody and trying to be serious at the same time. Mark that down on the list. For, exactly. Uh, <laughs> yes, homework, homework. That's a good one to do while ironing because it's not worth watching it with full attention. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. That one doesn't require both eyes on the TV screen. So we have to think of a, a topic for next week. Oh, I'm sure we can come up with one. Yeah, yeah. It may be movies to watch while ironing. Movies so we, to watch no. while ironing. That's the, <laughs> I no. kind of like it. Yeah, I do too. <laughs> you know, I mean, those that you have either seen or those that don't really demand it's kind of like if you're ever on an airplane and you have your collection of things to watch that you realize, I really don't want to sit and actually watch this movie, but I do want it to still be happening. So you could so. read a book while watching the movie or Iron or but, yeah. something like that. That sounds like a plan. That's right. I like it. That's a list right there. Oh, yeah. boy. That could be a fun one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Sharknado, Good. that would go on that. <laughs> there you go. Oh, it's Sally Sharknado, one of your favorite movies. Yes. I, I, I meant to mention it. I'm glad it got in there. <laughs> we wouldn't be doing our jobs if we didn't mention Sharknado. Sharknado it's yeah. a combination exactly. of both of these categories, horrific okay, events so and natural I, disasters. Yeah. I do think before we wrap this up, we should each pick the worst from these categories. The Everyone worst. gets a vote for the worst. Oh. And I'll start. All right, go for it. Pompeii. Pompeii, that came out last year, the, right? Yes, it is. It is it, it is a trip back in time where you where wish you, don't you go. had not shown up. <laughs> no, it's just horrible. And, and and what's worse is you just slug through all of these boring people saying, at least we're going to have a great volcano rush, and it's really disappointing. And it's the worst of computer generations. So I mm. vote for Pompeii. All right. Okay. Um, I've you know you got to go with snakes on a plane. Is oh, I was gonna take that. <laughs> All right, my bad. I'll, I'll, oh, that's okay. <laughs> go ahead, go with it. He's got more. <laughs> yeah, that one's pretty bad. Well, I think Piranha 3D. It just has everything, including Richard Dreyfus dying in the beginning of it. True. Uh, yeah, I was gonna go <laughs> s- snakes on a plane to me because well, I'm uh, I'm an Indiana for uh, Indiana Jones type of guy. Snakes. Why did it have to be snakes? <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, Mars attack. Mars great. attacks has to be up there as, yeah, as Mars well. Yeah, Mars attacks is. That's like the worst Jack Nicholson movie of all time. It's oh. hard to believe that he's even in the movie. Put it this way: me and snakes, considering our visitor last week, Einstein, for about a moment, I looked in that box when he first came in and, and thought like, that uh, better not be a snake. <laughs> and then it turned out to be a small alligator, and I went, "All right, I can adjust." Snakes, not so much. <laughs> no, I'm I'm with you on that. Good. All right. All right, Mark, thanks for joining us. Okay, uh, enjoy the rest of the, the show and the television cameras and all that. Thank, thank you, Mark. Mark. All right, we'll see you next week, Mark. See you next okay, week. Okay, bye-bye. All right, Mark Schumann with us here on Radio Arts and Leisure. I just wound up taking over here. Sorry, guys, you take oh, us no, to the break. Oh, no, you're fine. We got a commercial <laughs> break coming up, and after the break we got uh, Catherine Michaels to talk about everybody's favorite subject this time of year. How etiquette, to, yeah, yes. etiquette at a baseball game. Ah, love it. This one could go on forever. This could take <laughs> a while. All right. We'll, we'll be back after a break. Alliance. We are an industry leader in coordinating transportation.